And the name of the sermon this morning is Stand Your Ground. Stand Your Ground. Okay, so we're going to read over this scripture. And uh, as, as Christ had put this on my heart, <clears throat> I've heard it preached many times, taught it myself. Um, he just opened this up to me in a whole different realm, and I'm excited uh, to share this with you. And as we go through talking about the armor of God and making it make sense, we're going to go deep. We're going to go deep into this. We are going to teach it uh, till it's finished. So how long? I don't know. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of series, but I'm a big fan of the assignments of God. And when he gives you an assignment, you do it until it's completion. So we're going to take our time and we're going to enjoy it and we're going to do it to its completion. So let's open with prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I'm asking as in your seats if you'll join me just with eyes closed and heads bowed. Heavenly Father, come before you in that precious name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Lord, as I, I share with the congregation, I come before you, Lord, and I openly give my prayer to, as an example to them. I'm asking that they have their prayer right now from their mind's heart, Lord, to your ears, Father. But mine goes like this. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> forgive me, Father, for I'm not worthy to, re to, to even preach your word, Lord. Allow my words to fall void, Father. Cleanse me with your Holy Spirit. Wash me with your Holy Spirit. Wash me with the blood of Calvary, Lord. And Lord, uh, forgive me for my sins and my secret sins, Lord. Lord, I come before you, open up my heart, open up my ears to receive it, Father. Don't let anything stand in the way. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. And as we read, if you can look on the screen, very important, look on your phone. As long as you're not doing something you're not supposed to be doing, not saying you'd do that. And, um, but I want you to be part of this. Uh, there's a big thing about learning is being able to see the word at the same time. So if we go into the first screen, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. Finally, <clears throat> be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in, this he in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, stand firm. We're going to finish reading this. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and on and as your shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought." So we are going to back up here. We are going to camp out a little bit this morning in Ephesians, as we can see. And um, I'd like to address, as soon as I can pull this up for myself, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk a little bit about Ephesians in chapter uh, 6, verse 10 through 13. So I want to share with you and we're going to break this down a little bit. I have some notes that I've been taking. And um, let's go in verse 10. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord. And as we see, again, right away, it talks us right out, right out the gate. It says, be strong in what? In the Lord. And he's not saying in your strength. He's not saying in your might, not in your power. He's telling us right off. He's saying, be strong in the Lord. 
And then he goes on and he makes it very clear. And he says, in his strength, in his might. But now, as we go verse 12, this is going to start unraveling for you. Verse 10, put on the whole armor. So he, he makes sure to, to let us know it's from, from the, the belt of truth to the belt, to the, to the shoes, from the top to the bottom. He says, and he lets us know, put on the whole armor, not just the belt, not just the helmet. Don't just grab the sword. But he tells us to put on the whole armor, the entire armor, that we will be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So he's telling us, hey, the devil's up to something. The devil has a plan. He has a scheme. And he says, because he has a plan and a scheme, I want you to stand up. Christians, I want you to stand up. And as, as Russ was coming over here and he's talking about Swing for Freedom, God has placed in our care these, these young girls who are being abducted, kidnapped, boys as well, and, and they're turning into to sex crimes. And he's put that into our care as a church, as a church body. So God puts that into our care. We don't ignore it. We embrace it, and then we stand up. We stand up for his word. We stand up for what's right, and we take action. We don't just stand up. We take action. So we got to make sure that we read this word, we understand as, as Russ was coming up here, this came to us a, a few years ago before I was here as well. And Pastor Rook had, a, had a, just a beautiful passion to start this. And we will embrace it and we're going to stand up and continue the race. Now, here we go in verse 12. And this is where the meat starts coming in. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. Now, I want you to see it on the screen, read it on your phone, read it in the Word. But this is very important. This is where we're setting up camp. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So he's telling us, he's saying, listen, I want you to know this isn't just a physical battle. This is a spiritual battle on things you cannot see, okay? Okay. So he's talking about it and he's saying, now I want to clarify because people start, they, they fall off their chair and they start, as soon as you start talking about spiritual things, people get all Casper the Friendly Ghost and Spooky and Ouija board and they, they fall off their, 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 their chair. So I want to explain this to you and it's biblical and it's scriptural and I want to share that with you. But Paul is addressing that. He's talking about the spiritual warfare that we, we fight. I'm going to give you an example, okay? So everybody remembers uh, COVID and, um, and still around in the shadows a little bit, and we're still kind of pretty paranoid about uh, if someone has it, please stay home and, and so forth. And if you're sick, take care of yourself. But we've had loved ones who've passed away. We've seen people who, who got very sick from it, and, and it, and it caused them a fear. So at this time, I was an administrator, and I was working actually in Chicago at the time, and I was over at church, and... Uh, they had some terrible, they had a church fire, they had a pastor leave, and, and the sheep scattered, and then COVID came, and I was only supposed to be there for 60 days and come home. I was there for two years. So here was the thing. There was a, a, this is a true story. There was a lady there who was, um, who after COVID came, and she was on the worship team, she went home, and you would have swore she, she boarded herself in. She took a leave of absence from work. And after COVID came out, that spirit of fear came over her life so much, she wouldn't leave the house. She wouldn't leave the house to go shopping. She wouldn't leave the house to, to do anything. And she was in the house, and after COVID kind of came and went or got a little bit under control, guess what? That spirit of fear had such an ownership of her life and planted itself and kept her company that she wouldn't leave the house. She wouldn't leave the house. So then, it, then uh, it, it got brought to my attention. Uh, some pastors came. We started talking. And this was after I had left, and she was still in the house, that these pastors said, you know, we need to go over there, and we need to anoint her with oil. We need to pray over her. Problem is, she didn't want to let anyone in because she was so COVID paranoid and afraid. And so they went, and they, and they prayed for her, and they prayed over her. And I, I'm telling you, talking about a spirit of fear, that is a spirit, and, and you, can, you can have fear. doesn't mean it's always a spirit. So people get crazy about stuff like that right away. So I want to be careful. But she had the spirit of fear over her that she wouldn't go out. She was paranoid, locked the doors. And as they prayed over her, and they prayed over her, and they prayed over her, 
Um, she had fell on the floor, true story. She had fell on the floor, she got up, and you know, she was weeping, they had to make sure she was okay, and guess what? This was on a Sunday, and a Monday she went out that door, didn't carry the spirit of fear with her, but it was bounding her. It was bounding her, keeping her covenant, and, and keeping her slave and hostage right in her own home. Now, you can think, oh, well, does that always happen? No, it doesn't always happen. Can it happen? And has it happened? Sure. And this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about this, okay? He's talking about uh, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. He's saying, hey, it's not always something you can see. It's something that you can also not see. And he goes on, but against the rulers, against the authorities. So he's talking about, there's, he's even talking about demonic powers, authorities, against the cosmic power over the present darkness. He's talking about spiritual forces. Now, I'm going to take you down memory lane a little bit. We heard about Daniel, and Daniel says, hey, I'm praying, right? Remember, Daniel was praying, and that's where we get the, the thing of the Daniel fast. Daniel says, I'm praying, and I'm fasting and praying. What did the, and then when the angel came, Daniel was saying, what's up? 21 days ago, I started talking to you and praying, and, and where were you? And remember what the, what the angel said to Daniel? He said, I heard you 21 days ago, but I was fighting the prince of Persia, okay? He was saying, I was fighting a demonic force over the prince of Persia. So he's saying there's demonic forces over different regions, over different areas. Persia is Iran. He says, so I was fighting over this prince of Persia. I was trying to get to you. But he said, I had to call in the archangel. And the archangel had to fight me so we can get away from this. So he was telling you that this was real. This was real. And it was a real, it was battle. And I was fighting through it. And I was fighting over it to get an answer from God. And the angel says, I was coming, but I was fighting this battle. So when we see these things, and we talk about the battle, before the, the, the armor of God, before I can teach in it, and before we can help you understand, because we hear it, and it gets so watered down, we say, well, put on, put on the belt, and, and carry the sword, and put on the breastplate, and put on the shoes. And then we see it, but we don't really understand it in the depth that uh, the Apostle Paul's teaching it. So we want to understand Scripture in all, in, in all of its authority and what it means. Why? So we can use it to better our lives. That's what it's for. So that, now, here's what's going to happen, and I want to share this with you. A couple notes that I take. <clears throat> if you see what's happening as the Apostle Paul's talking about the belt of truth, because we're going to be going into the belt of truth here, and he's talking about the truth, the belt of truth being the word of God. He's talking about it being the authority. He's taught ab talking about being accurate. He's talking about it being your number one source. But let me give you just a flash. We're going to get through this as we go on here for weeks to come. But we look at society right now, <clears throat> and what are we doing? We hear of this, this movement that's happening in the United States, and they say, well, you know, you can be whatever you want to be. And they're, they're talking about this truth that they, they're saying, well, it's truth. If, if, I, if I'm a guy, but I want to be a girl, I can just say, I'm a girl. And if I'm a girl and I want to be a guy, I'll just say, I, I'm, I'm a guy. And, and, and if I want to say I'm a cat or a chicken, I can say whatever I am, because that's their truth. But let me give you an example. Anybody ever hear of gravity? Right? So if you decide, and we go on top of the building, me and Matt, and I say, well, gravity, and Matt says, well, I'm not afraid of gravity. I'm going to die first. I'm going to say, I really wish you would, but you go first. And because I believe in gravity, and I know the outcome of gravity, you're going to bust your head open. So that's a truth, right? The truth that we have is the word of God. It's the absolute, 100% accurate truth. It's the beginning, and it'll be the end. So we understand the absolute truth the further we get away from the truth, the further society manipulates it, changes it, crafts it to what? What they want. What they want. They want it to believe what they want it to believe. But it's not absolute truth. It could be their absolute truth, but it's not absolute truth. So the absolute truth that the Apostle Paul is talking about is God's word. He's talking about the absolute truth. Now, we see today there's so many churches that are watering down or placating 
the word of God to do what? To fit society. So they're, they're watering down or placating the word of God to fit society. But you know, the word of God is supposed to change us. It's supposed to transform us. We are not supposed to change the word of God to fit society. But that's what's happening right now. We're changing the word of God to fit society. Instead of, we're allowing society to mold and manipulate the word of God. And, and we know churches, even church in this town. We turn around and, and instead of going through the absolute truth, they're saying, well, it's close, but we just want to love everybody. We want to love everybody, so just bring everyone in. And, and God loves everybody. He died for everybody. But there's an absolute truth. So as long as we understand the can of worms we're opening up today as we start talking about this. Now, I'm going to tell you the scripture, but I'm not going to have it on the screen. I'm talking from 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel chapter, you can look on your tablets, you can look on your phone and your Bibles. And I'm talking about, again, spiritual warfare. And this is the first part that we're talking about, verse 10 through 13. But I want to read something to you. I want to explain it to you so you know that this is real. So in 1 Samuel 28, verse 5. So when Saul, everybody who knows who Saul is, Saul was one of, one of the kings of Israel, actually one of the first kings appointed kings of Israel. So when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid. Boom, okay, so he was afraid. And his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams, or by Urim, or by the prophets. So Urim are stones that they used at that time, and they were called them prophetic stones, that they were in an emerald, or they would light up. And if it was like a yes or no, or uh, peaceful, or panic. So he's, that's what a Urim is. So verse 7. Then Paul said to his servants, now listen to what Paul does. He's praying to God. He doesn't get an answer from God because God had already took the kingdom from Saul and took his, his communion with him away. And he goes on and he says to Saul, then Saul said to his servant, seek out for me a woman who is a medium. So she's, she's a witch, witchcraft, okay? That I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, behold, there is a medium at Endor. Verse 9, the woman said to him, so he goes to this woman, and he says, hey, you know what? I want you to get a hold of someone, and I want you to contact Samuel. Samuel's dead, okay? So he's going through the back door. What am I showing you this morning? It exists. It's in the Bible. I'm not trying to get all spooky on you, and I'm very careful how I teach and preach this, but we have to understand the Word of God to understand how it delivers us, how it's represented, and, and we don't want to, to not understand in, in its entirety. Now, hold your thought. I'm going to go on a little rabbit trail here. I'm very careful about this <clears throat> and, and had to be careful about preaching and teaching this. I'll tell you why. Because there are some people who get fanatical, and I'm going to give you an example. Okay, I'm going to give you an example from our past church. So no one here, okay? So they love studying the, uh, studying the end times. That's beautiful, study the end times. I love studying the end times. But they were so obsessed with studying the end times, you know, they could tell you uh, the color of the horse that Jesus Christ was going to return on. They could tell you all these cool things about the end times. And they were so enamored about the end times. That's all they talked about was end times, end times. They could quote it from, from the beginning to the end. But what happened was the Bible is meant to understand and learn in its totality from the front cover to the back cover, everything in between. We need to understand the Bible in its totality, everything. But when we get so enamored about something, we set up camp and we learn 25% of it as the 100% and we forget about the 75%, what happened when he had marriage problems, when his kids struggled, and they had drug problems, when things were happening in his work, he didn't know the whole rest of the Bible, how to love and how to pray through and how to break through because the camp was set up at the end times. 
And all he was was waiting for God's return, and he forgot to how to do everything in the middle. So we got to be careful that we don't allow something to become bigger than our God. Okay, here's an example. How about I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. Now, you know what? I'm a Christian, and I vote accordingly. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. I'm a Christian, and I vote accordingly. But if we say, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, and I set up camp in there, I'm saying, that's become more important to me, has more authority to me than God himself, because this is my God. No, I'm a Christian, and I place my vote to line up with the word of God. That's how I place mine. Not telling you how to place yours. That's how I place mine, okay? So, now, we're going to move forward. So we see that Saul, he goes to this sorcerer. So what am I showing you? I'm showing you that this exists. And verse 9, the woman said to him, Surely you know Saul. <clears throat> Surely, she says, because Saul, he, he has a cloak on, and he's covered, and he goes in, in, in the middle of the night, because Saul himself made a rule against this. And, and the sorcerer, the witch, she's saying to him, the woman said to him, Surely you know that Saul, what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums, those are the, the ones who can do the reading, the <clears throat> necromancers from the land, then why are you laying a trap for my life to bring about my death? She's saying, you know, I can get in trouble talking to you. I swore to her by the Lord, <clears throat> as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you. She doesn't know it's Saul. Boom, verse 11, that a woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? He said, Bring up Samuel for me. And then she turns around, verse 11. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. So remember, Samuel's deceased. Samuel's dead. He's a prophet of God. She calls him up. How? From the dark side. She calls him up from the dark side. She calls Samuel up. And the woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You're Saul. In verse 13, And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up from the earth. So she's seen Samuel rising. And he said to her, <clears throat> what is the appearance? Saul wanted, what do he look like? And she said, he looks like an old man coming up wrapped in a robe. And Saul, he knew from the description that it was Samuel. And he bowed down with his face to the ground and he paid homage. Verse 15. And Samuel said to Saul, now listen, now Samuel's dead. He's getting called back, called up by this, this, this sorcery, this witch. And he says, and Samuel says to Saul, listen to what he says, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I'm in great distress, for the Philistines are wearing against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you, to tell me what I shall do. So Saul's saying, I'm panicked. I'm fear stricken. God's not talking to me. Someone's got to talk to me. Someone's got to tell me what the heck's going on. And, and he's coming in a spirit of fear. He's acting desperately. There again, I'm mentioning the spirit of fear. He's acting desperately. Verse 16, and Saul said, then why do you ask me? Since the Lord has turned from you and you have become his enemy. Because Saul Samuel had pulled the kingdom, according to God's word, from Saul and gave it to David. That's what happened before. And now he's trying to say, what is going on? The Philistines are getting ready to kill me. Verse 17, the Lord has done to you as he has spoke. Now this is the prophet Samuel saying, hey, why are you surprised? God tore, tore the kingdom right from you. I was right there. Matter of fact, he used me. This is before he died. And he says, and he tore it from you. And he goes out, the Lord has done to you as he has spoke, for the Lord has told the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, your neighbor David, because you do not, now listen to this, because you do not obey the voice of your Lord, and you did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, now listen to the judgment of God. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into its hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow, you and your son, you and your son shall be with me. 
So Samuel is saying, guess what? You're going to die. Tomorrow, you're going to be on this side. So he's telling them, you're dying tomorrow. He, he's giving them a message, and he's saying, tomorrow, you're going to be with me. So I don't know if David really wanted to hear, or, or uh, if Saul really wanted to hear that message. And the Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of Philistines. Here's what I'm trying to get. Now, the point that I'm trying to make this morning is when we hear about the armor of God and they talk about the principalities, is it real? Absolutely. It's here. It's biblical. It happened. It's biblical. And it still happens today. Why is that important to know? When we say put on the armor of God and we look verse 10 through 13, you have to understand we are fighting a spiritual battle about against something we cannot see. It's happening right now in the United States, across the world, in America. We are in a spiritual battle. But you know what? 90%, statistic, 90% of church people don't want to hear that. They want to hear, geez, don't talk about that stuff. So this is risky stuff this morning because people don't want to hear it. We just sing, want things to be warm and fuzzy and tell us all the cool stuff and everything's going to be okay and hallelujah and kumbaya and let's just go out. But Christ says, and David is saying right here, and we're learning this as Paul's teaching, put on the armor of God. Because if you don't know how to put on the whole armor of God and put on that belt of truth, what's happening in America in front of our nose, right in front of us, we don't know what to do because we don't know and we've heard the scripture and it's so watered down and we see the, the armor of God that it doesn't mean anything anymore because we don't understand the essence, the value, and the depth. That's called Bible literacy. When we don't understand the value and the depth of what it means and that we're in a spiritual warfare and that we have to put these on and if we don't have the belt of truth, you know what happens in America? I'm a kitty. And you have schools across saying, we got to put a kitty box in here because they say they're a kitty. And our government and our president has signed decrees to honor kitties. Like, come on, folks, there's something wrong with that. There's something totally wrong with that. And as Christians, if we don't stand up to the truth, well, how do we know the truth? We don't even know we're in a spiritual battle. That's what I'm talking about this morning. We're in a spiritual battle, and people don't know we're in a spiritual battle because this hasn't been rolled out to them so they can understand, wow, there's something going on here. When you have the president of the United States making a special presidential decree to accept the abnormal against the word of God and say, huh, I'm going to say it's normal. And I'm going to put my John Hancock, and I'm going to sign it, and everyone has parades, and we have a 30-day rally for abnormal. There's something wrong with that. But we don't want to hear that. Don't bring that to church. Don't say it over the pulpit, because you know what? It's offensive, and, and they might not like us. But God tells us, if we stand for the word of God, they will not like you. He says, they will not like you when you stand for the truth. They will not like you. Okay. But God says, I'll like you. Because he says, I need you to stand. That's what he's saying. I need you to stand. Now I'm going to give you one more here. Running out of time. I'm getting excited now. I'm going to preach it. I'm, I'm fired up. Okay. You got everybody here? No one's fainting? You guys are okay? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to go to Acts, chapter 16. Acts, chapter 16. Look in your Bibles, verse 16 through 21. This is actually my favorite way to preach. I love teaching. Acts 16, verse 16 through 21. Now, we took you from the Old Testament to the Spookies. Now we're going to go to the New Testament to the spookies. And this is what's really cool, and I want to show you the power of the God that we serve. Here it goes. You ready? I'm going to read the story, then I'm going to explain it. <clears throat> so we have Paul, and he's kicking it with his buddy Silas, and they're going around, and they, they're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. They come into this town. Verse 16, as we're going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. So he's saying basically she's, she's possessed. 
and he brought her owners much gain for fortune telling. So she has an evil spirit in her. She's able to read fortunes, and they're making a lot of money off of her. And so they're saying, man, she's, she's, she's good for us. She's profiting us. We're making money off of her. But it says here in the Bible, she is a spirit of the devil, divination, okay? Now, verse 7, and this is what's really cool. I'm going to read it, then I'm going to explain it. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. So if you can see this, this dirty little peasant girl, little slave girl, she's calling, these are men of God, these are men of God, these are men of God. And they're sick of it because they're, they're incognito and, and you have the spirit, but here's what's happening. Listen to this. The spirit recognizes the power and the authority of God. That's what happened. Now listen, in your life, the spirit, the spirit of divination, Satan, the evil spirit, recognizes the power and the authority of God in you. But he also recognizes it if you don't have it. So, because what does the Bible say? Greater is he that, that's in me than he that's in the world. So if you have the power of God in you, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, boom, you got that hallelujah boy, you got the power of God in you. And he's saying, hey, you have this power of God. You have the power of the Spirit in you. He said, that's powerful. But even the demons and even the spirits will recognize it. That's what it's saying. It goes on. She followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God. That spirit knew the power of our God living and walking in these men. But he also recognizes it when you don't have it. There's a lot of Christians who come to church and don't have the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then people say, you say Holy Spirit, and they think, ah, not the Spirit. We had a hard enough time embracing Jesus Christ. Father, Son, Holy, our Father is God. His Son is Jesus Christ, and His Holy Spirit. In the Bible, He says, I got to go. And I got to go so the Holy Spirit stays here. That's the power. That's the authority. And he says, I got to go. So the spirit stays behind and he equips you and he teaches you and he empowers you and he enlightens you and he teaches you and he manifests the word of God to you. That's the Holy Spirit. A church will collapse and implode if the Holy Spirit is not functional and is not operating because then Jesus Christ is saying, I left and there's no spirit except for your flesh and your spirit and your ways. See? Now we say, wow, this is unfolding. It's starting to make sense, hopefully. Right? All right. Verse 18, and she kept doing for many days. Paul, so she kept following them, and she kept saying, these men are the most high God, proclaiming the way of the salvation. Verse 18, and this she kept doing for many days, and Paul, having become greatly annoyed, he turned around and he said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And they came out that very hour. He was done. Done. Because he had the authority and the power of the king. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ. Now I want to tell you something. Now, <clears throat> up on my PowerPoint, I have some fanaticals who come across if you guys can bring up my Buffy for me. No Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It was a show, this young girl, she went around and was defeating vampires. Anybody remember this? You know what? Leave the vampire slaying up to Buffy, okay? Stick to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of God in your home. And unless God tells you and he taps it and sends you a memo and says, hey, I want you to go start knocking doors, uh, knocking on doors and slaying spirits, Stick to your business in your own ground. Because there's too many fanaticals who get themselves in trouble and they open up Pandora's box and then they turn around and they can't handle what's in it. So unless God has appointed you, unless God has commissioned you, he's given us the spirit, he's given us the authority, okay? And it says it in scripture. Now, next screen. John 
14, 6, Jesus said to him, I'm the way. And what does he say? The truth. We're teaching about the, about the truth. We're setting it up. We haven't even got there. We'll wait till next Sunday. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So number one, Jesus says, I'm the author. I'm the finisher of truth. Okay, next screen. John 15, 26. I just talked about this guy. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, the spirit of what? Truth. Rhonda, you want to grab my belt for me? So we talk about the belt. We talk a belt and the sword. So number one, he says, but when the helper comes, whom I'll send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth. So we put the belt of truth, but he says that power with the belt of truth operates in the spirit who, who proceeds from the Father. He will bear witness to me. Next one. <clears throat> Ephesians 4.15. What is it all about? Why does he want to put us, want us to put on the belt of truth and the armor of God? Okay? So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about. So, okay, just stay here. So here we have, this is just a weightlifting belt and a good way to show you. So he says, put on the, the belt. What kind of belt is it? Truth. It's a belt of truth. He says, put on the belt of truth. So he tells us, I want you to put on the belt of truth. So, number one, belt of truth. And the one who's supposed to drive the belt of truth is the Holy Spirit. So the belt of truth is the word of God. So the belt of truth, word of God. If you don't know the word of God, you won't know how to use the word of God, right? So number one. And then we have, we have the, the sword. What is the sword of? Okay. So we know the sword. When, when a soldier, he put on his military gear, he had to have a belt to hold up the whole thing, right? He had to have the belt to hold up all the gear, right? He couldn't just have a sword. He couldn't just have a head of breast. The, bre the, the belt is the foundation. The word of God, the word of God, the gospel of God, the Bible from the beginning to the end is the power it's the truth. Remember I talked to you about society making their own truth. The truth comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of God. The foundation is the truth. When you pull out the sword, okay? When you pull out the sword, folks, and my arms are too short, but when you pull out the sword, <laughs> cut off my fingers, <laughs> then I'll be like this. Then you'll be paying attention as my blood is squirting, right? When you pull out the sword, he said, and you have the word, this is bound by what? The truth, the belt of truth. So as you pour out the sword, you need to know the word of God. You need to know the truth of God. That's our foundation. As Christians, that's our foundation. And that's what we're going to be talking about in the next, I don't know how many weeks. And, okay, now we're going to back up. So we talked about Samuel, we talked about Acts, we talked about the slave girl, we talked about them casting the demonic spirit out of her just by calling out the name of Jesus Christ. And like I was saying to you, and I'm going to say this disclaimer again, unless God has called you to that, you're equipped with that, but unless God has called you to that, you need to keep it in order. Okay, so in John chapter 15, uh, verse 26, I want to read this, and I think you have that scripture up on the screen. When the Helper comes, who will send to you from the Father the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he'll, from the Father, he'll bear witness to me. So we talk about the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and as we talk about the Holy Spirit, we have to understand the belt of truth. And we're going to be talking about the belt of truth. What did we establish this morning? I want to go over this. Number one, verse 10, 11, 12, especially in verse 12, it talks about the demonic forces that we fight. That it's not just a physical battle, but it's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. And then we brought up an Old Testament scripture so you understand it's not something I pulled out of the hat. Foundation, talked about the witch, talked about Saul. We heard about Samuel, all these recognitions. We went to the New Testament also 
um, making things solid. So it wasn't just an Old Testament, it was a New Testament thing, but it's a today thing. When we read this scripture and we understand this scripture and we understand it's in its totality, we'll understand, you know what, we're fighting a spiritual battle. Now, I want to read this one more time. So if you can go to Ephesians 6, verse 10. And I want to explain it. And hopefully it has a little more meat in it before we dismiss. Finally, be strong in the Lord. So he's saying, not your own strength. Be strong in who? The Lord. And in the strength of his might. So he's saying, listen, yes, he's saying, and he's acknowledging it's a battle. But it's not a battle that's meant to be fought alone but it's a battle that's supposed to be fought through the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. And then he says, here's what I want you to do. Put on the whole armor of God, not just the helmet, not just the breastplate, not just the shoes, not just the belt, but of the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the devil. He doesn't say, hey, I want you to kick down doors. He said, I want you to stand. Pretty easy. I want you to stand for what? For the word of God. How do you stand for the word of God if you don't know what the word of God says? You need to be standing for the word of God. Okay, now, verse 12. And here's where he explains it. This is what we, we filtered. This is what we, we taught this morning through Old Testament to New Testament. I'm going to read it again. For we do not wrestle. And we know what wrestling is. Wrestling is a sport. Wrestling is, we know that as you wrestle, there has to be confrontation. You have to have hands on. You need to wrestle. And he says right here, verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. He's saying, hey, if you think it's just here, there's a realm you cannot see, that you cannot touch. He's saying there's a realm beyond this, beyond this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers, over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So he's telling us, listen, this battle, if a church doesn't know how to do battle, if a church doesn't know how to do spiritual warfare, if you can't even say and say, well, I didn't know all that, and maybe some of us did, but now you do. And I say, I don't understand. There's a spiritual battle. This lady who's bound by fear in her house, locked her doors went for over a year and three months, nothing, in fear, because the spirit of fear and these pastors came and anointed or prayed over. Now, I want to be careful because there's some people who will be fanatical and say, well, you just got this spirit, you got this spirit, and they start, start uh, becoming, casting everything out. I'm, I'm careful of those people, just as careful of those people as the demonic spirits because they're crazy in their own right. So the big thing with that, we need to be careful. It has to be aligned scripturally. It has to be aligned spiritually. So we know the foundation that we're standing on, what we're talking about. So again, when you see this, and we understand the word, and we start understanding the armor, it has a whole different meaning. Because you're saying, wait a minute, that armor, Paul is telling us, we're going to go to battle. And we're going to put on all of our armor. And we've got to get ready. And this is a battle that we're not maybe going to fight. You will fight. You will fight. It's a battle that you will fight. It's a battle that can be right in your home, but you don't even recognize it because you never, never taught. And it's a battle that can be right there and taken over your family and taken over your finances and it can be taken over your life. And even, and I, I've dealt with men, and I'm, I'm going to say it's not here because everyone's going to start looking around, but I, I, I've dealt with men who were just so sexually deviant, deviant and so obsessed with pornography that it turned into chi child enticement. Because the spirit came in and it took over their life, took over their hormones, took over their life, took over their physical life. It's real. It happens. Let's not talk about that until it happens to you. So we see this and Paul is saying, hey, be guarded. Know what you're fighting and know how to fight it. Isn't that powerful? That's powerful. No, I know we went really deep today and everybody's going, shush. Let's stand up. Let's worship God because you know what? He says, yeah, let's clap. Let's give God a hand clap this morning. And the word of God is powerful and the word of God will set us free. And if we grabbed a hold of this, praise God.